dear distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, dear students, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the 200, 2021 Nikki Lafis lecture, which is the third lecture in the brief so far history of the Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, before, uh, in this lecture, we invite, as you know, distinguished scientists with specialty in theoretical astrophysics uh, to visit the fourth and the uh, institutes and the University of Crete and interact with the, the scientists and the students here. Uh, our uh, uh, LAFIS lecturer for this year is Professor Evine van Dieschek uh, from the University of Leiden. Uh, the Netherlands, and uh, I will talk more about it. But before I do, I would like to give the podium to Professor ne uh, Nectaris Navarrakis, the, the chairman of the board of directors of Ford, who will say a few words. Good afternoon and a very uh, warm welcome to all of you who are here and also to those who are listening and uh, following these proceedings from uh, 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 remotely online. Uh, it is really a great pleasure uh, to be hosting the third Tilafis lecture this year uh, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Ewan uh, uh, von Dishok. Uh, she is going to be talking about uh, the formation of stars, planets, uh, and the ingredients of life. She will be properly introduced by Vasilis, as you heard. But let me say a few words about uh, the new institution of Tilafis lectures that we started here at Fort. It was started uh, in honor of Professor Nikos Kilafis and his continuing efforts, intense and continuing efforts to foster uh, astrophysics research, uh, not just in Crete, but also in Greece in general at the national level. His efforts have been instrumental in also uh, creating, setting up and creating the new uh, uh, Institute of Fourth uh, dedicated to astrophysics, uh, astrophysics research, the Institute of Astrophysics, which was established just a couple of years, a uh, few years ago. Uh, his efforts have been paramount and his persistence and perseverance uh, were really essential uh, towards establishing this uh, institute, which started its life uh, taking uh, into um, uh, its main directions, the pursuit of excellence that is common among all four institutes. And already there have been uh, strides of success with uh, uh, um, awards that are given to researchers of the Institute of Astrophysics, also high profile publications. And uh, really congratulations are in order for, for this uh, great start. Uh, today, uh, as I said, we are hosting here the uh, third Kilafis lecture, which comes as, a, as an addition, uh, as one more uh, um, uh, initiative to the initiatives that we've ha we have uh, here at Fourth over the years to foster excellence. For example, you already know about the Onassis lecture, uh, and the lectures that have become a long tradition here at Fourth. Also, now we have the intramural uh, Fourth Synergy Grants and uh, the Fourth uh, Research Award, uh, in addition to the Kilafis lecture, uh, that is already now becoming a tradition. And I would like to uh, congratulate the Institute and Vasilis uh, Harmandaris for actually holding this um, uh, lecture despite the pandemic, despite uh, the conditions and the earthquakes. So for those brave of you who are here <laughs> and daring ones, uh, I'm sure that we are going to enjoy the lecture uh, by Erwin. And uh, I would like to just present you with a small gift on behalf of the Foundation for Contemporary Technology. It's uh, a gift of paper. I will now say a few words uh, more formally for, uh, uh, for some of you. Uh, first, some things about Nick uh, Kilafis. For the, the people who have been here a while probably know him uh, much better than I do. Uh, the younger ones may, may not, so I should say, say a few things uh, about Nick. 
Nick has been with us uh, since uh, 1985 as a faculty at the Department of Physics of the University of Crete and affiliated researcher of what was to become fourth a couple of years later. Uh, Nick and our distinguished lecturer here share a common uh, path in life. Both of them started their uh, academic careers as undergraduate students in the old Europe. And then uh, they moved across the Atlantic. Nick went to the great place of the Midwest at the University of Illinois at Urbana where he did his PhD. And after that, he moved uh, further west uh, to Caltech where he worked uh, with Professor Goldreich on uh, what was to be known uh, as the goldreich kilafis effect. And then since he couldn't move further west, he came back east. So he went to Princeton where he worked uh, on the first uh, radiative transfer models for, to understand the way radiation is being distributed in galaxies. And uh, this was work that he did with Professor Bacall. And even though he was offered and started as assistant professor at uh, New York, at Columbia University, he decided to leave the US and come back to Crete and uh, join the Department of Physics. He was convinced by the people at the time that it was a good idea to do so. And we are very happy that he actually made that decision because if it were not for him, we wouldn't be here uh, today. So this is the career uh, of Nick. And I would like to say a few words about uh, our third Kilafis uh, uh, speaker, uh, lecturer. She is very well known among the academic community of astrophysicists. So some of you will, uh, will uh, know all these things that I will say. Uh, she is, uh, Professor Van Dyshoek is considered because she is the world expert in uh, molecular astrophysics. She started working on the subject uh, when well before astrobiology uh, was in fashion. She did her PhD at Leiden University and then uh, she went as a fellow at Harvard and then at Princeton. And then she went to Caltech as an assistant professor. And then she was lured by the good weather of the Netherlands and uh, decided to leave the sunny go uh, golden state and came back uh, to the Netherlands as a professor at Leiden. She has received numerous awards. We just heard that she was awarded uh, her second ERC advance grant uh, uh, recently. And she has received some medals, I will mention them. It's the gold medal of the Royal Netherlands Chemical Society because her first degree was actually in chemistry. The Burke, the Burke Award of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK, the Albert Einstein World Award of Science. And uh, also she was awarded the James Greg Watson Medal in the US and uh, the Kavli Prize for Astrophysics, which also has a substantial uh, a prize money associated with it. She is a member of the National Academy of Science, the Academy of Science of Leopoldina. She's an honorary member of the Royal Netherlands Chemical Society. And uh, what is more importantly, in 2021, Pope Francis appointed her to the Pontifical Academy of Science. Now for an astronomer to be approved by the Pope is something, it's probably the ultimate prize that one can get if you consider, if you go back 400 years ago. So we are deeply honored that uh, Professor Van Dijsek will talk to us about building stars, planets, and the ingredients of life in space in her lecture today. And uh, following the Greek tradition, we will uh, offer her some uh, presents uh, in addition to what uh, the chairman just gave. I have them here. It's, uh, it's a book of uh, pictures we took from uh, Skinakas Observatory. It's in Greek. Very nice. It's in Greek. Uh, I'm sure Professor Van Dijko, if, if, there, were, uh, if there were math symbols, it, she could easily read it. But there are no math symbols, it's just pictures. Uh, there is a small coffee mug and, uh, and a jacket, uh, uh, rain jacket for the days in the Netherlands where there is no sun. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here and we we'll look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, directors, uh, Nick, uh, uh, colleagues and, and friends here in the audience. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's a great honor for me to be here and to give this lecture. Um, also, welcome to those of you that are online uh, viewing this. Um, I hope in the 
coming sort of 50 minutes to take you on a tour of interstellar space and uh, tell you about our origins, about building stars, planets, and the ingredients of life for life in space. But first, I want to thank the many students, postdoc colleagues that have all have contributed to this uh, research. So uh, a lot of the credit really goes to, to them uh, rather than just to me. I also want to thank Nick because uh, our paths actually first crossed in Princeton, in the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, where we are actually both uh, having offices down in the basement of Building E, which is here uh, just uh, beyond that. But uh, my whole field of star and planet formation actually owes uh, much more to Nick and to, to Crete, uh, because there were a series of uh, workshops of summer schools uh, than the um, NATO Advanced Institute uh, workshops and summer schools that actually happened in Crete in the 1990s. This first one in 1990, maybe I should try this one. And the second one actually here in uh, 1998. And that was the one that I attended and where I actually lectured. And that was actually a crucial book. Uh, people are still teaching from this book uh, because this really set the stage at that time for, uh, for the field. So these were really critical in developing the field. There was something else important happening in Greece, and that was the IEU General Assembly in 1982 that actually happened in Patras. The IEU is the International Astronomical Union, the worldwide organization of all astronomers, and uh, uh, that uh, has once every three years its big meeting, and that actually happened in 1982 here in uh, Patras. And if you go back to the newspapers and look at that, uh, there are various uh, just by, by chance, some, some uh, things that happened there uh, that are very relevant also for this lecture. There was a naked eye comet, actually, that put in an appearance at the IEU. It was Comet Austin. You could see it with the naked eye beautifully during these two weeks. And there was another, a new commission was put into uh, operation at that time already in 1982 uh, to search for extraterrestrial life. So it was clear that at that time people were starting to think about how stars are formed, how planets are formed, and uh, uh, about the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe. In the universe. Here you see already uh, the, the words of spectroscopic activity, uh, evidence for biological activity. And we see, we will see at the end of this lecture that now we are actually getting to that stage that we might want to, are able actually to search for those uh, effects. Good. So um, our Milky Way, I realized that not all people here in the audience are astronomers, probably most of them are not. Um, and so uh, I will give a, a rather general talk, but uh, try to also link uh, with some of the other fields that are represented here, like chemistry, like biology, like electronics, and, and show you also the importance of technology in uh, driving our field. But the basic fact, namely the night sky, that's available to everybody, everywhere in the world. And we can look at it, even with social distancing, as you see over here. And when you look at it, uh, you immediately start to think about, you know, where do we come from? What is our place here in this, uh, in this universe? And these are questions that uh, fascinate not only mankind, but you see it actually throughout society. One of my hobbies is actually looking at astronomy and art. Uh, which is also one reason I'm fascinated by the Feistel's uh, disc. Um, and uh, of course, in the Netherlands, I don't have to go very far. I just go to Vincent van Gogh, to the Starry Night. Uh, he just had to paint that, uh, uh, the, the sky there, and uh, I was fascinated by, by the stars. But you go to a completely different part of the world, uh, namely the Australia Aboriginals, and uh, there, um, actually, the Milky Way is dreaming is, is part of their cosmology, part of the way their society works. And you see here indeed the Milky Way is the seven sisters here, the Pleiades and the uh, uh, Orion, actually the old man actually chasing these seven sisters. Now the Milky Way, you can see it beautifully also here from Crete. This is a picture taken here in, in Western Crete or here from the a uh, nice observatory, the Snidaka's uh, observatory that you can actually today beautifully see uh, um, uh, on the top uh, of, of the mount there. 
Um, and so what I'm actually going to show here today is that we, uh, our solar system was once born in one of these dark clouds that you see here in the Milky Way. So if we could step out of the Milky Way and look at it from above, uh, then this is an artist's impression, but based on actual scientific uh, data, um, then it would look, our, our Milky Way would look something like this. Here in the center is a black hole, a massive black hole, supermassive black hole. That's what the Nobel Prize uh, last year was awarded for. Uh, and the rest you see here, there's some uh, 250 billion stars. And our star, the sun, is one of those 250 billion stars. And we live you know, somewhere in the outskirts of our Milky Way, uh, around a rather ordinary star uh, on a small rocky planet. And we are just one of those 250 billion stars. So that puts the whole question as to are we alone already, uh, even within our own Milky Way in a different perspective, because our Milky Way is just one of several hundred billions of galaxies in the universe. Now, one of the most exciting developments in astronomy has been the uh, discovery of planets around other stars. You saw already the example of a planet passing in front of the mother star and, and showing a little dip in the intensity uh, that is called a, a transit. And that's one way of finding these planets around other stars. The other method is looking for the tiny wobble that an unseen planet actually induces in the mother star. Uh, our sun also wobbles a little bit because of Jupiter uh, tagging on it uh, just a little bit. Uh, and this has been leading to the Nobel Prize in 2019. But what have we learned from all those surveys? Well, from all those surveys, we've learned uh, that uh, planets are common around other stars. Um, on average, every star has at least one planet. But we've also learned that the bulk of those planets are not like the planets that we have in our own solar system. They are what is called super Earth or mini Neptunes. So a few times the mass of Earth, a little bit less than that of Jupiter, uh, which is about 10 times the mass of, uh, of Earth. And so that immediately then leads to age old questions as to you know, how were they formed? What leads to this enormous diversity of planets that we see around other stars? What are their composition? What is their, uh, could they be habitable? And those are some of the questions that we are now starting to study uh, now that we know that uh, planets are, are common. And directly related to that is the question as to how were we formed some four and a half billion years ago. Uh, and we're getting information of that also in our own solar system. For example, from this asteroid uh, that was uh, visited by the Hayabusa 2 mission, the Japanese or a similar asteroid visited by the Osiris-Rex mission and bringing some material back to Earth that you can study in a laboratory on Earth with the, the most powerful techniques, uh, nanoscience techniques uh, that, that we have. And the other part is the, the comets. This is just rock. This is rock plus ice. And uh, here, for the first time, uh, mankind actually landed a probe on the surface of a comet and was actually able to sniff the gases that came out of that comet and the composition basically of the material uh, of what, which we were made. So these are all messengers of the early solar system and I'll come back to them at the very end. Now let's start in our journey between the stars. So this is a constellation that most of you recognize, I hope, <laughs> uh, this is of course Orion. Um, but few people actually, when they look up at the night sky, uh, start to ask the question, what is actually in between the stars? Space in between the stars is not empty, but it's filled with a very, very, very dilute gas, much more empty than any high, ultra high vacuum that we have here on Earth. On average, maybe only one atom per cubic centimeter. The denser concentrations of that gas we actually call clouds. And we see those beautifully here in the Orion Nebula that is in the sort uh, of uh, Orion. Now, if you look at these, these clouds or cloud complexes, as you see here in this little animation uh, data from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, um, then we see that these cloud complexes are actually some of the biggest and most massive objects that we have in our galaxies. They can be uh, tens of light years across 
and they can contain actually enough material to maybe form uh, 100,000 uh, new stars like our sun. Now, it actually won't do that. It will do that only with an efficiency of a few percent, but that's a, a, an entirely different uh, lecture. What is important for this lecture is that these clouds are dark. They are dark because they contain not just gas, not just hydrogen, but they also contain tiny little dust particles. Uh, dust particles the size of, say, a tenth of a micrometer, so uh, 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 ten thousandths of the, the width of my hair, um, and they consist of silicates, uh, think of sand grains like you have here on the beach, uh, and carbonaceous uh, material. And these uh, uh, dust grains are important uh, because they actually shield the molecules from the harsh UV radiation of the bright stars that you see here in the surroundings. They're also important because they provide for the molecules a place to sort of meet and greet uh, in order to form a new, uh, new particles. And they're actually quite cold and uh, their densities are somewhat higher than in the average, but still very, very low, only about 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. So let's actually look a little bit more at the chemistry here uh, between the stars. So what you see here is a, a star forming region where at this moment, maybe some 100 new stars are, are being uh, born. And it turns out that if we now start to point our telescopes at one of these dark clouds, uh, then we can actually study the chemical composition of that region in great detail. So this is actually the way that an astronomer looks at the periodic table, uh, not quite what you're used to uh, from high school. It's uh, mostly hydrogen, actually uh, one by number, uh, then helium, uh, about 10%, but helium doesn't do much chemically. Uh, the chemically more interesting elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are down at a fraction of a promil compared with hydrogen. So we have this very cold, very empty space, mostly hydrogen, so chemistry astronomers don't even bother to look for molecules. You won't find them. Under these conditions, you won't be able to form even the simplest molecules. And so the surprise really came that when astronomers started to turn their telescopes on these clouds, that they actually turned out to have a very rich chemistry in spite of being uh, cold and tenuous. So what kind of molecules are being found? More than 240 different molecules have been found, but let me just give a, a handful of them. Uh, water, of course, a very important one. Uh, here you see uh, methanol, you see uh, uh, dimethyl ether, you see cyanides uh, happening there. So uh, it's really a, a, a both simple and also more complex molecules. Here's one molecule that's also found a molecule that's familiar to most of you here in the audience, that's of course ethanol or better known as alcohol. And so maybe by the end of this lecture, if we don't have uh, something to, to, to drink, uh, you can go and uh, tap a beer uh, or a glass of wine out of uh, one of these interstellar clouds. And just to give you an impression of the scale, um, the Orion cloud, probably has enough alcohol in it to fill something like 10 to the 27 bottles of good Greek wine. So uh, that just gives you a little bit of an impression of how much there is actually of these uh, ingredients there in space. And there are also some other even more complex molecules like the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, that uh, we have uh, here, the pAhs, uh, even though we don't know exactly uh, which of these pAhs it is, but as a class of molecules, they are clearly present. On the other hand, the simplest amino acid, um, uh, glycine, has not yet been found, uh, nor has this molecule, a uh, simple molecule, uh, better known as caffeine, which uh, may not be important for the uh, origin of life, but uh, certainly important for the, for the maintenance uh, of life. So let's look a little bit more at one of our favorite uh, targets. Uh, this is a source of which we have done uh, a lot of research. This is actually a, a little binary star that is forming and uh, that turns out to be particularly rich source of organic molecules. And uh, then as soon as the ALMA telescope became online, of which I will tell you a little bit more in a, in a second, uh, that is actually when we started to find that this source was even more incredibly rich in uh, um, 
in, in, in simple and, and complex molecules, uh, as we see over here. This is just one of the frequency bands of ALMA, and we see there are already more than 10,000 lines. And we can uh, identify them actually very accurately, uh, better to one part in 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7. And if we have a molecule uh, that we identify, like the ones that we have here, we really know that's 100% certain because we have uh, you know, sometimes uh, dozens of lines uh, that all agree in frequencies uh, to, to better than uh, one part in 10 to the 6. And so you see already uh, uh, two carbon molecules, three carbon molecules. We, we are going up actually in, in complexity. We're also seeing some of the CNO bounds, uh, like you have here, the isocyanates um, that uh, we have over here, methyl isocyanate, here's acetamide, uh, glycolonitrile. Uh, these are all molecules that are, are starting to become already interested uh, in terms of uh, prebiotic uh, um, uh, material. Um, in fact, if you think of biological molecules, so prebiotic is more the potential of, uh, uh, of becoming part of, of, of living systems. Uh, biological molecules are those that are actually in living systems, uh, such as here, uh, this molecule uh, ethanolamine uh, that was discovered uh, just earlier this year. And uh, what you see here is these molecules are actually part here of of cell membranes and, and, uh, and phospholipids. Um, so this is already, again, a, a step up in that kind of complexity. And even though we cannot find yet the most complex molecules in space that sort of their bi biology uh, colleagues uh, are used to, um, certainly there are, are ways uh, when you have sort of these ingredients like the simple molecule formamide, and you would bring it on a young planet and you would have on that young planet, also some liquid water presence and maybe some clays uh, that are there, because we certainly know that there's also some of that material present. And then there are various uh, synthetic routes actually to go to these more biological uh, molecules. Now we're simulating actually some of this also in our uh, Leiden laboratory for astrophysics. And uh, this uh, is, 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 is certainly, uh, at this very moment, uh, doing fantastic work, both in terms of spectroscopy, but also in terms of understanding the processes that actually lead to these molecules. I mean, once one thing is detecting them, the other thing is actually um, uh, understanding how they actually came to be formed. And even though we detect these molecules in the gas through their rotational spectroscopy, um, we uh, think that the bulk of them are actually formed on the surfaces of these tiny little dust grains um, as, as ices. And that is what we actually try to simulate here in the, in the laboratory. And so let's just take water, very simplest molecules. Uh, how was that made? Well, here we have a simulation based on our laboratory experiments. Um, and uh, what you see here is a grain and maybe once a day, a hydrogen atom lands on that grain. Ah, there it comes. It scans the surface. It may find another hydrogen atom goes off, makes molecular hydrogen, one of the most important molecules. But it can also encounter an oxygen, the red ones. Here we make molecular oxygen. And here we're starting to make hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, there we're going to make hydrogen peroxide. And we make now two water molecules. And uh, now we fast forward from a few days to say 10 to the four years, 10 to the five years. And this is how we build up uh, an icy layer of, um, of water here on the surfaces of these, of these dust grains. And again, if you notice this is a simulation, it's based on laboratory experiments in at least three laboratories based on models and based on astronomical observations. Um, so what I always uh, like to say is that um, you know, think about it when you drink a sip of water. What we're looking here at actually water molecules that were formed already some four and a half billion years ago in the cloud out of which our solar system collapsed. So as one of my colleagues put it actually, the water is older than the sun itself. Of course it has so evaporated, it has recondensed, evaporated and recondensed, but the original bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen was made already some four and a half billion years ago. Good. 
Um, and so we see water uh, around most forming stars and planets. We've used the Herschel Space Observatory for that. And we can translate a signal like this. Uh, the strength of the signal is actually related to the number of molecules. And so we can basically count the number of molecules that are present. And in this particular planet forming disk, there are probably some 6,000 oceans of ice available for forming uh, planets. And this has not gone unnoticed even by the Big Bang Theory, uh, where you see here that uh, they actually have uh, both water and ionized water here on the whiteboard uh, uh, in one of their episodes. So to summarize this part, uh, we have seen that interstellar clouds, in spite of being so cold and tenuous, actually have a very rich chemistry. We see complex organic molecules and water throughout most of the Milky Way. And as we see a little bit later, there is a large similarity actually in the composition with comets. And this all means that the building blocks for the prebiotic material are actually widespread. A few words about astronomy and technology, because we, our field is really driven by new technology. I mentioned already the Herschel Space Observatory and the HiFi instrument that was built under leadership of the Netherlands. This was the water chaser. This is what we used to study water in space, also because we needed to be above the Earth's atmosphere because there's so much water in our own atmosphere, the astronomical signals would not be able to get uh, through. And just to show you another example of how far technology has come, in the 1970s, you know, we had single pixel receivers. Think of your CCD camera, but then with just one pixel. Um, that gave us these rather, uh, you know, less detailed uh, maps. Now look at what our technology gives us, gives us these beautiful images here in the far infrared part of the spectrum. Here we see the dust actually glowing uh, in the star forming cloud. And all of these point sources that you see over here are actually new stars that are being formed at this very moment. The need for new instrumentation is particularly important for studying the regions in which new planets are being made, these disks around the young stars, uh, because these disks are small. On the scale of this uh, uh, image, uh, it's not like as big as you see over here in this artist impression, but it is actually tiny, 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 uh, about a factor of uh, a thousand smaller than the, the size of this cloud. So it's this tiny little dot over there. So we needed to develop actually new technology in order to be able to, to zoom in on those disks to the sharpness of ALMA was really needed. And so the Atacama Large Millimeter Array is actually the first worldwide collaboration in astronomy. It's a collaboration between Europe, North America and East Asia to jointly put this collection of some 66 antennas on a high altitude plane in Northern Chile. Now, why Northern Chile? Well, the New York Times said it already. It's truly high and dry uh, over, over there in this uh, region. Uh, our transporter has upgraded a little bit from the, the donkey that you see over here. This is actually the transporter that is now used to transport one of the antennas from the, the mid-level facility in order to be high site. And it's really a testimony to, to high-tech technology that all this instrumentation came together in one place in Chile from all over the world. Uh, you know, they arrived in ships there, were transported there to the uh, mid-level facility, put together, uh, tested, uh, and then driven up to the, the high side at 5,000 meters and uh, then put into the, to the array. Um, and then in addition to the antennas, F behind each of the antennas are the eyes and ears of the telescopes, the correlator uh, and the receivers, that those are the eyes. And again, this is a, a testimony to, to actually nanotechnology of getting the incredibly sensitive uh, receivers that you have uh, behind each of these telescopes in the various receiver bands. And we are, we are proud that in the Netherlands, we are actually uh, providing several of these uh, receiver bands. So what does ALMA do? Uh, these antennas actually move together on the sky as an interferometer, thereby simulating a much larger uh, dish and being able to see much sharper. And they follow then uh, one of these objects like you see over here. You see, for example, here the uh, Magellanic clouds, uh, and they follow them actually uh, as they go over the, uh, over the sky. Good. So let's look a little bit more about 
forming new planetary systems. So we talked about clouds and those clouds can be stable for maybe a few million years, 10 million years, but ultimately gravity will win. And gravity basically means that the clouds will collapse. It will form a protostar at the center, um, but because the cloud always has a tiny little bit of rotation, that means that the material cannot continue to fall in radially, but will actually end up in a rotating disk around the young uh, star. And so the molecules that were built actually in the dark cloud will actually uh, end up here now in this uh, rotating disk around the young star. And that is actually also where the, the planets uh, are being formed. So how do we know that planets are being formed there? Well, it's very difficult to detect the planets themselves, but what you can actually do is uh, uh, look for the consequences of a planet in such a disk because it will create a cavity, a hole actually in that disk. And this is sort of a little bit in analogy with our own uh, uh, solar nebula hypothesis uh, because the planets in our uh, solar system all are located in one plane and orbit in the same direction. Uh, that is already an indication that they likely formed in a rotating disk like we saw. Now, again, the theories of those planet forming disks date back already many centuries. But uh, sort of the, the, the observational proof did not come until some 25 years ago. And some of you may recognize these iconic images of disks here on the Orion Nebula uh, made by the Hubble Space Telescopes, where we see them actually as a silhouette because of these dusty grains, these dusty disks. We see them uh, actually as a silhouette here against the bright background. And these images were actually very important because they uh, not only showed that these disks were present, but they also gave the sizes. They were actually uh, comparable with the size of our own solar system. Sometimes you see them edge on, sometimes you see them face on. Then 20 years later came ALMA, and this is one of the iconic images now from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And one of the surprises was that this disk was so structured. Everybody had expected a very smooth distribution of dust and gas, but it actually turned out to be uh, very structured with, with these dark lanes that are again uh, of the size of our own uh, solar system. Um, now the power of ALMA, just to illustrate to you, uh, pre-ALMA, this was sort of the best image that you could get after two nights of observing of one of the pre-ALMA arrays, but then even in 20 minutes uh, with the, uh, just 16 antennas, ALMA improved on that image already enormously. But it also started to show these, these fascinating other types of structures, not just cavities, but also, uh, as you see here, rings and very asymmetric structures. Um, and here, that is actually uh, what started uh, a new era of observational planet formation, uh, basically starting uh, a few years ago. Um, here is some of our own, one of the first images that we got, very asymmetric uh, um, peanut-like structure, uh, which turns out actually to be a gigantic dust trap. And then came this image, uh, other images, all of them uh, very uh, uh, structured uh, images that you see here in these, uh, um, in these uh, OMA images. And in fact, this is some of the latest results, uh, gallery of, 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 of images. Um, and you see that the bulk of them actually all have these rings, uh, maybe some spiral structures, some of these asymmetries uh, seems to be quite common. Now, what causes these structures is not yet clear. Uh, one of the uh, interpretations is that uh, what we are looking at is actually a dust trap. Um, this is actually where the dust uh, will uh, concentrate here whenever you have a pressure bump in the gas. And that is because the gas is actually moving in capillary rotation, but is also a little bit supported by gas pressure, whereas the dust is not. So there's a tiny little difference in velocity between the gas and the dust that causes the dust actually to spiral in and to concentrate in, in pressure maxima. And so when you have a planet that is present in such a disk, that will actually create what is called a particle trap here right at the, the, the pressure bump. Now, this is one of the uh, leading explanations 
for explaining all of these structures that we see. It's not the only one. In fact, the theorists have come up with all kinds of explanations in order to explain these fascinating structures having to do with so-called dead zones in the, uh, in the disks, uh, zonal flows, opacity changes, et cetera. Um, but it is a fascinating uh, topic that is actually happening at this moment. Now, so far we've looked at the dust, but uh, the gas is of course the dominant uh, component of these uh, disks. Uh, and I could give a whole lecture on that, that which I won't, won't do. Uh, this is very much, of course, where our research uh, looking at molecules is, is focused. Um, but let's just say that there are, are many surprises there as well, especially that we see very structured in the different uh, chemical molecules, uh, but they are not necessarily related to the dust structure. So this tells us something interesting also about uh, the gas. A polarization, measuring magnetic field, that's another ingredient of this that we would like to know. And so uh, actually very deep observations uh, have now discovered the polarization of some of these disks. This is one of the brightest disks. Uh, we are looking here at a level of 0.2% of the peak. Uh, that's how low the polarization level is. And everybody was hoping that it would tell us something about the magnetic field that is so important in the, the, the structure and evolution of these disks. Um, but it turns out actually that uh, uh, when you look at sort of the, the orientation of the, the polarization factors, uh, that it is mostly self-scattering of the dust. But just a few weeks ago, there was this paper looking at a line there in a disk, a very strong line here, there it is at, uh, multiplied by 0.002, see here the line. And this is the other polarization components, the Stokes, so-called Stokes Q and U. And what they're seeing here is actually the goldreich hilavis effect now in a protoplanetary disk uh, in the line winds. And so this is uh, sort of the first opportunity to, to tell us something maybe about the magnetic fields in these disks, um, because people have also looked uh, for the Zeeman splitting uh, and not yet found it. So this is, uh, uh, Nick, <laughs> one of your uh, testimony to your work uh, that it is now being applied also to protoplanetary uh, disk here. Now the ALMA era has really brought something more than just looking at a few structured disks. We can now actually go to large samples. We can go to a cloud that we have on the, the sky like the lupus molecular cloud. And uh, there we actually have more than 100 young stars with infrared access. And we can point ALMA at all of those young stars maybe for just one minute. And we already have a very high signal to noise detection of all of those disks. So these are all disks in which new planets may be forming at this very moment. And you can look at their distribution, um, their mass distribution. This is the amount of mass uh, that you have in dust. And this is in Earth masses. And this is what you would need in order to form a giant planet. So the big question is, do these disks which we so easily detect now, do they have actually enough mass to form a planet and especially a giant planet? Well, the answer, this is a, a, a cumulative uh, distribution. Uh, the answer is no, the bulk of them do not have enough mass to form another, uh, to form a giant planet. And it, in fact, it depends very much on age. Uh, the, the older the star, the less material there is available. We can go to high mass regions like Orion, and do the same study there. We go here, the trapezium, again, that we were looking at previously, the trapezium region. Here are lots of other young stars that are being formed. They look remarkably in terms of their mass distribution, like what we find in lupus and in other low mass star forming regions. So the disks away from the bright massive stars are similar to, to lupus. But once you get close to the bright stars in Orion, those very massive stars that are putting out so much UV radiation, uh, then you find that the masses are much lower. And we can actually quantify that uh, also how little, uh, uh, how, how quickly actually these disks actually lose their, lose their mass. So certainly the environment in which a new planetary system is, is formed uh, matters. And our solar system could well have been formed in a cluster with some massive stars that could have affected the evolution of our young uh, solar system. Uh, in fact, uh, just recently we uh, completed a program that looked at some 872 disks all across Orion, 
Um, and what we found was again, that uh, all of those, those 800 something disks look very much like the disks that we have in, in Orion in terms of their, their mass distribution. But if we now look at the younger population in Orion, uh, then we see that there is a clear offset. These disks are much more, are much more massive. And that is important because we're now going to make the connection again with exoplanets. This is what uh, mature disks are, their average mass in, in Earth's mass. This is what young disks are, some factor of 50 difference. This is what we know from the catalog of exoplanets that have been detected, what their mass is in solids. Conclusion is that mature disks don't have enough mass to build uh, exoplanets. Uh, you need to do it in a very early stage. Uh, planet formation needs to start already very early, probably within a million years after the collapse of a, of a, of a cloud. And the required formation efficiency is about 15% in the, the earliest phases and about 30% in the, the later phases. So you still need to turn a significant fraction into, uh, into your um, planets. So to summarize this part, uh, planet forming disks, uh, nearly all the young stars are surrounded by disks. The sizes of those disks are comparable with our own solar system. The masses of the young disks are enough to form planets and the structures in these disks actually point to planet formation in action happening at this very moment. So also the ingredients for planet formation are common uh, in our Milky Way. I promise you that I would come back to the disks, uh, the Feistel's disk, because we were talking about disk evolution, and I just like to use this this little example here of a, of, a, of an old disk <laughs> that you that you see here, um, that uh, of the Feistel's disk that I'm so grateful that uh, that I now have. Uh, it's a more modern disk that has a hole in it and that shows all kinds of uh, of colors. Um, I also want to stress the uh, importance of big multinational. Uh, projects, because this is actually, um, uh, Alma is one example of that, but there are more examples of that, uh, where uh, they actually have open data and open archives that are accessible uh, anywhere in the world. So people, usually after one year of proprietary time, can actually take our uh, data and uh, do uh, then also research with them wherever they are in, in the world. Okay, let me just skip this and go now to the diversity of planetary systems. So again, a piece of art from centuries ago uh, that shows actually our own uh, Milky, uh, our own solar system. Uh, at that time in 1798, uh, seven planets that were known, a few comets. And this artist already speculated about all of these other planetary systems. Some of them closer by, some of them farther away, uh, some of them uh, few planets, some of them very many planets. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. This is an engraving that uh, uh, is actually in our collection uh, at home and uh, that we treasure because it was so much forward looking to actually uh, uh, what, what we see actually in our data today. So planets form, but how? You know, this is what we can observe, exoplanets. This is what we also can observe, those tiny little dust grains. And we can see them still growing to about a millimeter, a centimeter in size, but that's it. Then they become invisible to our telescopes. And so what happens in between? And this is, you know, something like 13 orders of magnitude that we need to cover. And we know we need to do it quickly. I say here three times 10 to the seven years, but maybe in some cases we need to do it already in less than a million years. We need to cover that scale. Now we have information from our own solar system. That's why I came back to the uh, to comets. Um, solar system constraints, but you know that's only one solar system <laughs> and four and a half billion years ago. So um, if you go from grains uh, to planetesimals, um, then uh, this is sort of one of the uh, scenarios that we have. Uh, we haven't found a way yet uh, to effectively cover those 13 orders of magnitude. We have scenarios, but certainly not yet proven. Uh, but in some way, these, these tiny little dust particles need to collide with each other. Uh, they need to grow. So you see them here colliding with each other, growing. In some cases, the collisions are too powerful. They will split apart again. Uh, but overall, gradually, gradually, they will grow and form uh, larger, uh, um, uh, larger
larger bodies. Um, so here we actually uh, have the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the scenario for planet formation. We start here with these tiny little dust grains. This is what we want to end up. And this is now a very critical stage uh, of a few kilometers in size, planetesimals as we call them, um, because that is when gravity again starts to take over in controlling the dynamics of these, uh, these objects. So comets are, which is the size of these, these planets, planetesimals, comets a few kilometers diameter, uh, those are really the building blocks of, 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 of new planets. Uh, and that. So let's then look at comets in our own solar system. Comet Hill Bob, beautiful. Uh, you could see that in uh, 1996. Uh, but then came Rosetta that actually landed on a comet and was able to, to study that in, in detail. And it was able to study that in detail because Rosetta actually had a very good nose, uh, a, a mass spectrometer, uh, so-called double focusing mass spectrometer, which has a very high space, very high mass resolution uh, that can actually very accurately identify individual molecules. And so what did Rosetta see? it actually saw a lot of the same molecules that we actually also see in our planet forming uh, uh, young disks um, in our clouds. Um, here you see the, some of the similarity in the uh, composition that we saw in that uh, object in Ophiuchus that I talked about. And you see many of the same molecules uh, coming back there and, and not just the, the same type of molecules, but even quantitatively, uh, there is a very good relation here between the molecules in a star forming um, cloud and uh, here in this uh, in this comet so suggesting that these molecules were indeed formed already in that very cold uh, stage uh, prior to star and planet formation and then largely preserved uh, then as the comets and the planets uh, formed now could these new worlds be habitable uh, we don't know yet that's of course the the big, the big question. We know that the ingredients are there, but that doesn't mean yet that uh, they will become uh, habitable. One of the things is that they need to be at the right distance, of course, from the parent star, not too cold, not too, too warm. Uh, and in that sense, uh, our Earth is just at the right distance from our mother star, whereas Venus is too hot and Mars is a little bit too cold, at least at the moment, it's, uh, it's too cold. But this is really where the next generation of uh, instruments is actually focusing. It's going to search now for the signs of biosignatures in the atmospheres of these exoplanets that have now been uh, discovered. And when I say uh, biosignatures, that's much more than just water. Just water is definitely not enough. You also need some organics like CH4, uh, but maybe some nitrogen oxide. It's really a combination of molecules uh, that uh, sets Earth and uh, where which has living uh, um, um, uh, material on it uh, that uh, sets uh, uh, that apart actually from the other planets. And so this is an intriguing set of, of planets that uh, new telescopes will certainly turn their uh, attention to. Uh, Proxima b, our nearest star, has a planet actually called Proxima b, Proxima Centaurus uh, b. Um, and here the TRAPPIST-1 system uh, which is a low mass star, but which has seven of these Earth-like planets all lined up very close to the star of which at least three of them are in the habitable zone. Uh, and so that is where the new telescopes like you see over here uh, are going to turn their attention to. So that's especially the, the James Webb Space Telescope um, and uh, that will be launched hopefully in December 18, that it's uh, this year, uh, after a 30 year uh, um, a journey to, to build it. Um, and uh, that also has instrumentation on board that is very suitable for looking at these various ingredients. And then you saw here on the other side, the extremely large telescope, uh, the ELT of the ESO that is being built at this very moment in Northern Chile. Uh, on Cerro Amazonas that will be 39 meters diameter. Just think of that. If you look at this, this room is even bigger than, than this room, 39 meters diameter, um, which will have its first light somewhere around 2027. 
So I will stop here and uh, if you have the time and uh, just say that it has been an incredibly exciting journey here uh, to look and search for our origins uh, in space. Uh, we are now at a very exciting time where we find not only exoplanets, but we also are, are finding the regions in which they are built at this very moment. And we are probing sort of the chemical composition uh, that is, is available to make these uh, planets. Um, so I'll stop here. I thank you for your attention. And I want to, uh, again, thank the university for this honor of giving me this lectureship. Thank you very much. And maybe if there are some questions in the audience to our speaker. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's not just water ice. There, there, there are many tastes of ice, so to say, in space. You can make methane ice, uh, ammonia ice. All of most of these complex molecules are actually made on the surfaces of these uh, of these dust grains because that's where you can bring the the molecules like like oxygen and hydrogen actually together to form these bonds. How do we know that this is common? Well, basically, whatever direction we look in space. And we've looked at hundreds of directions and uh, young uh, forming uh, stars. Um, we find that the, the, the basically the composition is the same. We find the same uh, sort of uh, amounts of water uh, there, um, water ice. Actually, we see the water ice directly in our, our spectra. So we know it is uh, in that sense universal that we, wherever we look, uh, that, uh, that we actually see it. Uh, maybe a follow-up question to what you mentioned. Uh, uh, you, you discussed about the importance of the laboratory measurements and the work that you do also at Leiden. Uh, however, uh, in space, as you also mentioned, the conditions are very different. Typically, the densities are much lower. The effects of gravity are different. How, how challenging is to make uh, good experiments on the ground and uh, take care and address those Potential, potential yeah, systematics. Yeah. yeah, well, it depends on the type of question you want to answer. If you want to answer how a water molecule is formed on a uh, on a on a surface of a, of a grain, um, then that uh, you can do that uh, under normal Earth Earth condition. There should be no effect. If you want to study the process that I showed in that movie of how two uh, dust grains uh, or bricks actually come together and stick, etc that you will need to do in, in microgravity or in zero gravity environment. So that is why uh, you have these sort of parabolic flights, for example, where people have their experiments and they, they then have a, a, a tiny, uh, you know, a few minutes of zero gravity in which they can do their uh, experiments and, and shoot these particles on each other and see whether they stick or not. Um, so um, as I said, it depends on the question that you're trying to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the exciting lecture. Uh, as a biologist, I, I'd like to ask a question about uh, whether or not we can actually detect uh, signs of life in the form of biogenic gases, for example, or molecules. Very recently, there was a debate about Venus where the phosphine gas was detected in the atmosphere. I was wondering whether or not this could be also something that uh, we could somehow incorporate into our search for life in exoplanets. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there's a, indeed a lively debate going on uh, on what constitutes a, uh, a convincing detection of life uh, in another planet, what kind, what combination of molecules you would need. As I said, just water and ozone is probably not enough. You need another reducing mechanism molecule. One molecule that has been suggested is actually uh, uh, CH3Cl, a uh, freon, <laughs> um, because it is, at least on Earth, uh, quite unique uh, to, uh, to living systems. Um, 
so and there's vegetation edge that you can see the green vegetation edge uh, or maybe on another planet that may have another color, uh, but uh, you see, you can see a vegetation edge in the optical part of the, the spectrum. So, so I think people are converging on sort of a, a broad set of indicators that all need to happen if you want to, to claim that there is possible life there. Um, the, the phosphine story on Venus is a, is a, is a different story, I think, uh, because there, I, the, the first question is still, uh, the debate is still whether it is detected at all. <laughs> um, so, so that uh, still has to be confirmed or not. Um, and then if it is detected, whether it's really a signature of life or, or whether it could be made in abiotic ways. Yeah. Uh, yes. In between stars, um, uh, th there are massive clouds. And from what I understood, uh, uh, a great percentage of them is hydrogen. Uh, <laughs> Can this um, can this amount of hydrogen and other um, elements, of course, so, um, uh, form stars? Um, not like Jupiter or Neptune, not like uh, gas giants, uh, but actually stars. And it is actually more of a philosophical take, but can, if this is possible, um, can this postpone like the death of the universe, all the stars dying out uh, in the long run, like on the cosmological scale? Yeah, 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 yeah. So indeed, uh, when a cloud that consists mostly of hydrogen with here and there a few other elements like carbon, oxygen and nitrogen, when that collapses, it, it makes basically a star. I mean, our sun was was made out of such a collapsing cloud. Uh, and, and that elemental composition is largely preserved. If you look at the composition of the material between the stars of the clouds and the material of our sun, they are very similar. So uh, the abundances are very similar. So that is basically <laughs> uh, um, uh, our, our star is made from a, a cloud that collapsed under its own weight. And now your question of, of uh, how long can star formation still continue is a very good one because uh, as long as there are still uh, clouds around, you can make new stars. Uh, our galaxy is actually a, already quite a mature galaxy in the sense that it's 90% stars and 10% clouds. So it has already turned a large fraction of its gas into stars. If you go to the early universe, their galaxies have a much larger fraction still of, of clouds, of gas, uh, that they need to turn into stars. Now, eventually, indeed, also our galaxy will run out of, uh, of, of gas. So it's still forming about one star, uh, one solar mass star uh, a year, our galaxy. Uh, also, some of the dying stars return material to the interstellar medium. But ultimately, in a very long time, uh, we may run out of uh, our galaxy may run out of uh, uh, material. Uh, thank you. Nick? For the benefit of our students, would you be so kind as to tell us one or two exciting things that you expect from the new telescope, the James Webb Structural Telescope? Uh, the, 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 the James Webb. The James 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 Webb. Webb. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so the James Webb Space Telescope, well, actually, it's going to tell us really the, um, this is some sort of uh, uh, what we expect uh, to see there, is really the gas out of which, the composition of the gas that makes planets. And the whole question uh, that we are is, is, is uh, what determines whether we make a water-rich planet or a water-poor planet. Um, and that has all to do with these dust traps. These dust traps can actually lock up material um, and, and prevent it from coming into the inner part of the planetary system and uh, then uh, becoming uh, basically part of a planetary atmosphere. So the whole question actually of, of linking 
sort of what we see in exoplanets with the formation location of such a planet that history uh, I think is a is a very uh, a very exciting uh, part and so this yeah so I'm really looking forward to it and expecting surprises there. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. UV radiation will just break this bond and and just uh, make it OH plus H. OH will break further in oxygen plus hydrogen. So that is why you need these dust grains that absorb and scatter the light that shields actually the, uh, the molecules from that dissociating radiation. So that's why you need to go to these, these, dark, uh, these dark places. But yeah, anytime you have a, a light, <laughs> a, a very powerful light source there, uh, then, then you will start to dissociate the molecules. Yes. Uh, I mean, we can search for anything, <laughs> but looking at it, uh, first water, I always get the question, just even also from the TV here, uh, does it need to be water? Can it be not, you know, some other uh, liquid that is important for, for creating life? Well, you can think of ammonia, you can think of methanol uh, liquids that uh, bring actually uh, um, molecules together. Um, but water, we know that water is at least an order of magnitude more abundant. So uh, just simply because oxygen is the third most abundant element in the universe. So, so that, is, that is one key element. Uh, Carbon-based versus silicon-based, again, it's, a, it's at least an order of magnitude in terms of abundances. So um, the carbon is just much more <laughs> available and it's just such a versatile uh, element. I mean, carbon can bond so easily. Um, so, so there's no reason a priori to to expect something uh, something else. It it can happen, but it's not the, the most likely outcome. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, it's not that I forgot it, but I was waiting up until the end of the lecture to actually, in addition to the present, to actually give uh, the uh, how do we call that. The certificate that you were here on that specific day. Uh, let me give it to you. And I would also like to invite Nick uh, if you could come here for take a picture, the three of us. I would like to thank you again for finding the time in your busy schedule to was, visit Crete. It was our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being brave enough to be here for us. Thank you.